Hi, my name is Mike Dillard, and this is Self Made Man, the podcast for men who want to leave their mark on the world and create a legacy of honor, integrity, and achievement in every aspect of their lives. I'm glad you're here, and once again, it is time to forge your destiny. So over the past 10 years, I've never taken on any investment capital for my businesses. I've always felt that a business worth investing in is making a profit. But if it's making a profit, there's no need to sell equity and take on debt in order to grow. Well, today's conversation with Chase Jarvis has shifted my thinking on that. If you're not familiar with Chase, he is a world-renowned photographer who made his mark shooting campaigns for Volvo, Nike, Apple, Microsoft, Columbia Sportswear, REI, Honda, and Red Bull, to name just a few. And in 2010, he started a company called CreativeLive.com. Now, over the past few years, Creative has become one of the most successful e-learning platforms in the world. They have over 2 million members, and the content that they produce is from some of the best teachers and names in every category that you can find. When it comes to business and entrepreneurship, you're going to find courses by guys like Tim Ferriss, Ramit Sethi, and Ryan Holiday. So today, we're going to sit down with Chase to learn the story behind its inception and some of the biggest lessons learned when it comes to growing the company, including their decision to raise investment capital. And one of the single biggest takeaways from this episode for me was his conclusion that it can actually be riskier to play it safe when it comes to building a business today. If you have a proven idea and a product that people are buying, your best move is to scale as fast as possible because if you don't, somebody else will. It's definitely food for thought, and this was just one of many incredibly valuable insights from today's lesson. So without further ado, please help me welcome Chase Jarvis. Hey everybody, Mike Dillard here, and welcome to another episode of Self-Made Man. And today's episode is one that I've really been looking forward to for the last couple of weeks that it's been on my calendar we are being joined by Mr. Chase Jarvis, who is the founder of Creative Live and one of the most renowned photographers uh, out there in the world today. We've got a ton of mutual friends in common, and Chase has been up to some amazing things recently. So, Chase, thank you so much for joining us here on the show today. Thank you so much for having me, Mike. I'm happy to be here. So, we've got a, a lot of a lot of friends in common who <laughs> we do. Yes. We have so many friends in common. We've been in the same circle for a long time. Yeah, well, it, and it's amazing because coming full circle, where you came from as a photographer or an artist or a creative, if you will, is a pretty interesting path to have taken to to have started in that mode and to ended up where you are today. At, you know, the the founder of a cutting edge tech company. You're going to be here in Austin for South by Southwest and interactive and all of that good stuff coming up here. So there's got to be a hell of a story behind that that progression or adventure, if you will, that I'm uh, I'm dying to dive into today. Oh, sure, man. It's so it's it's uh, certainly it's definitely not the straightest line for sure, but uh, it's something I'm proud of actually. And and ultimately, I feel like the world of become you know being a creative or professional artist, you know, prepared me very uniquely for I think leading sort of the business of tomorrow is very creative. And, and, you know, maybe that's a good place to start is, is like, I'll use the word creative or creativity. And uh, it, there's sort of two ways I think about it, the creativity with a small C, which is like the act of, of making stuff or, or art, like music, photography, design, uh, whether that's UX design or graphic design or music and audio, all that kind of stuff. That's creativity with a small C. But I'm also thinking about creativity with a big C, like, you're building businesses. We have a lot of friends who are building businesses and that's absolutely a creative endeavor. But so is like theoretical science, you know, e equals MC squared is, is theoretical science plus creativity coming together to, in, in one equation, say e equals MC squared to define the universe. So, you know, I don't want to, I want to make sure we're talking about creativity in the broadest sense possible, but those things and that those sort of fundamentals are a huge part of a, a my life. But I feel like I feel like creativity is the new literacy and it's something that is, it's at an all time high. We use words like innovation and whatnot every day, but we don't really have a good sense of where that comes from, how to cultivate it and necessarily culturally why it's critical for, for our future. So yeah, that's, that's, I wanted to just get that out there early. Any particular questions you want me to answer on my start? I mean, (laughs) you want me to go way back? Like I was born and blah, 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 (laughs) or give me the lead in here, Mike. Well, let's, 
start at the place where you've been paying your bills as a photographer for a little bit. You're at the beginning stages of your freelance career as a photographer, and you've sure. gotten your first big client, your first big gig. And I've heard a little bit about this story, uh, you know, from uh, your episode with Tim Ferriss. And the part that I thought was really interesting is that you reached, or at least you had a conscious thought to position yourself as the go-to person and one of the best in the industry. And you decided to charge a really premium price for that. And I think that's an unbelievably important uh, decision that you ended up making that affected the rest of your career. And I think it's an inflection point that every skill-based entrepreneur, if you will, no matter whether, whether you're a photographer, whether you're a masseuse or a personal trainer or whatever it may be, faces. And so I would love it if you would really just start there and what you were thinking and why you made that decision and, and what the impact has been on your career since then. Sure. I think a good way of uh, thinking about it, actually go, it dovetails really well with, I think, the theme behind your show and even the title is that if you don't, if you don't write your own script, someone else will write it for you. And when I thought, you know, at that point where I had also just bailed on so many things that other people wanted for me, you know, I, I, I uh, was on a track to medical school. I had just quit uh, pursuing a career in professional soccer and was really chasing the thing that I wanted to do more than anything. And the thought, you know, it's like, okay, I'd taken these, what I consider to be big steps, just, you know, boldly walking away from things that other people wanted for me. And like there has to be, there, there's so many layers to that onion. And if you build something with the end in mind, to me, that helps you get there. So the picture that I had was just working for the kinds of clients that I wanted to work, work for, the kinds of people I wanted to work with and what I wanted that life to be like. And in all those sort of pictures that were in my mind, I felt just at a, at a very intuitive sort of cellular level, if you will, to the more crisply I can define that. The, the more likely it is, you know, I guess what's that saying? If, if you don't know where you're going, you'll never get there. So I wanted to as crisply as possible to find that. And the pictures that sort of filled my head were of just working with the top, say, pro athletes and, and celebrities in the world, but not just in a documentary fashion. I wanted to be making pictures rather than taking pictures. And I wanted to, to do so in a way that reached, you know, millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people. And so they were, it was largely connected with, you know, large brands and budgets that would allow me to sort of get there. And then at the same time, have it be really solely soul fulfilling and authentic work that represented the kinds of things I'd love to be and do. So I mashed those things together, actually. And the career that I created is, you know, literally the result of that. The career that, I, the career that I'm living right now, I should say, is a result of like thinking pretty clearly in, in terms of, you know, those, those pictures in my mind. So uh, the idea of an artist is this flaky sort of, um, <laughs> beret wearing cigarette smoking. Um, you know, I wanted to, to sort of eradicate that from people's minds as well. And uh, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm living that dream now. Uh, and it hasn't been without a lot of heartache, plenty of failure, a lot of ups and downs, but to be able to live a career as a photographer and then transition not out of photography, but more into adding another layer of entrepreneurship to that you know you mentioned earlier like starting creative live so yeah was there a particular shoot that really served as the big launching pad for your career as a photographer and if so were there a particular set of you know values that you approached it with before and most importantly afterward that really allowed you to continue up that staircase you will because you know, once you have an opportunity like that, it's just as easy to to make a wrong move or to get cocky, if you will, and and crash back down. And, and that certainly was not the case with you. At the core of your question, there is something that I'll jump right on, which is: was there any one moment? And the, you know, crystal crystal clear answer for me is that no, there wasn't one moment. It was a series of you know of dozens and dozens of moments realizing sort of what was possible and as I mentioned earlier sort of crafting that future for myself rather intentionally so that while there was no moment it was a series of things like I loved being outside and shooting action sports that were that's where my career really got started was in you know skateboard photography surf um, and, and I think people think oh yeah so it's you're a dirtbag that lives in a van and then you go around the world and no I was like I really want to take that that 
imagery and and make it mainstream. I happen to be really deeply embedded in the in the action sports community. I was living in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, you know, skiing, snowboarding, and goofing off with some of the best riders in the world. And it was then that I realized that wow, it's it's really a combination of fixtures of these people in the right place with you know it has to be of course best in class in order to to get there but it doesn't have to be small sort of industry specific stuff and so how can i take that you know and help my art reach a larger audience so you stack a bunch of those moments some of the you know the high points of you know discovering that it's very much about it, first and foremost the work you know you have to be able to to like in your case say developing a product or or in anyone anyone's case like the product has to speak for itself. It has to be able to stand alone. And the same is true with, with my photography. So like mastering the fundamentals was a, a big thing that I was very core on. And I didn't do it in a way. I didn't go to art school. I had basically dropped out of higher education on, on a couple different accounts in order to pursue my passion. So like self-study and being able to, you know, be a self-starter and, and teach myself, that was really, really core to that. And then how big can you dream? And you know, I, I was thinking about, well, I'm not going to necessarily want to work for the ski company for very long because their money's not very good and the reach is pretty small. But what if I could take these same sorts of pictures for, you know, the Nikes, the Apples, the, the Adidas, and the Vice magazines as opposed to just the the smaller local mags? And I set on a path to do that, and that's one of the things I feel like like why I really resonate with your message, your audience's message, is because all of the things around you they were basically developed and built by people no smarter than you, you know, and, and if you're going to try and shape your world, certainly the title is self-made, self-made, but even if there are lots of other players in your, your ecosystem, you are the one, you're the director. And, you know, see my earlier point about if you're not writing your own script and directing yourself towards what your ultimate end are, even if you're, you know, you start out by, just visualizing it and pretending and going through those motions, like you're never actually going to get there. And certainly there's other people, but you have to sort of believe that at a core value and you have to love the thing that you're doing. So I put those things in play, you know, again, early on big breaks for companies like REI, Nike, and in the world that I come from, you know, the, the industry is actually quite small. And I think this is true with more industries than people believe, but it's true. There aren't a lot of or big mistakes but there's a lot of small mistakes that happen. And, you know, that's, I guess I get some advice from Richard Branson, who is an investor in Creative Live. And, he, you know, he's always talking about mitigating the downside, like absolutely take risks, but create the, the world whereby your risks don't result in catastrophic failure. And so I basically have pulled on a bunch of threads, had small failures, but big failures in the photography world where people are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to do shoots that represent big brands. Like there really isn't a lot of room for error. So I tried to get that on sort of a daily, daily, weekly basis rather than a big project basis. And again, it helped me land, I guess where I am today. So, and were, so were there any, I guess, beliefs or values or behaviors or attitudes that you held uh, throughout those positions? Cause like you just said, you've got, a gig where they're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on media production and you're a part of that, their level of responsibility is massive and it can lead to unbelievably, you know, unbelievable, <laughs> unbelievable new doors and opportunities, you know, if For sure. you approach that, that particular job with a certain level of, of professionalism, if you will. And so did you approach opportunities or, or, or gigs like that with, I'm, going to set a new standard for the level of service provided and the quality of work where that was a really intentional part of your approach? Yeah, absolutely. That's a good question. And I, I should have jumped on that earlier because I know that was a part of your original. But I think the term experience comes to mind and, and crafting that experience very intentionally. Like there's the work and at the core, the work has to be good. Otherwise, none of this matters. But so, you know, I really set out to have great fundamentals and be a great photographer and director because that's sort of the get in the door fee. But beyond that get in the door fee, everything else is, like you said, it's values. And, um, and being known as someone who was able to take a concept and elevate it, pushing brands to take risks. You know, there was no such thing as behind the scenes videos when I started doing this however many, you know, more than a decade ago. And that was a story that I wanted to tell. And brands were always very reluctant. And, you know, fast forward 
to today and there's not a single campaign really that gets shot without a whole behind the scenes story being told about it. And, you know, that was something that I tried to bring in early, not because it necessarily only made me look good because it was adding value to the brand that I, I will have been working with. So it seems like, you know, creativity was at the core of it. You know, I mentioned the fundamentals, also very much willingness to take these small risks and to take it out of that beret wearing, like cigarette smoking concept of an artist and also take it away from the like, I'm hard to work with pain in the ass, nose in the air. Like I, I, I'm, I'm based more sort of around grit and authenticity and what you see is what you get. And ultimately those are the kind of people that hopefully at least, you know, I, I look around at people that I hang out with and we've already mentioned that, you know, I have a lot of the same friends. I think there, those are some common characteristics and leading with those values and, and trying to make pictures that no one else can make. And I think those are the things that I put into the work that ultimately, you know, translated into getting some bigger breaks and being able to be in, frankly, in a league, almost consistently always in a league that I was, I had no idea how I got there. Plenty of imposter syndrome. So if you're sitting at home thinking, holy shit, how, how, how did I, how did I get, <laughs> how am I sitting here doing this? I'm pinching myself. And, um, I was, yeah, and still am to this day, constantly finding myself in that situation. And um, so if you're not feeling that, you're probably not doing it right. Because I don't you know, there's not a single person in my circle of friends, regardless of the level of success or ambition that doesn't remind, isn't reminded of that on a pretty regular basis. So. Yeah, I, I think I don't know who came out with it. But you know, the phrase that I remember is if you're, you're not scared to death, you're not dreaming big enough. And, yeah. uh, that's, uh, for I, think sure. I think there's a somewhere. Mario Andretti quote about, um, if you're not, if you're not on the verge of crashing, you're not driving fast enough or, yeah, there's, there's probably 50 of those that we could apply. Awesome. But, yeah. I'll, yeah. So if you could in as much detail as you, as you possibly can, because there, there are moments that, you know, I think are really interesting if it, if it comes down to a moment and it may or may not, but if there was, what was the moment that you were inspired to to really come up with the idea for Creative Live? You know, was it at dinner with friends? Were you in bed sleeping at night and, and kind of woke up with this idea? But what was that moment of inspiration that, that brought that about? I think there I can trace it down to a handful of small moments, not, not necessarily one, but among them is, you know, making content. That's one of the ways that my photography got so noticed. I talked about the value of being great at your at your craft, but also about trying to be different, not just better. Like, how do you get noticed in a very busy world? And I'm sure, you know, our mutual friend Ryan Holiday talks about that a lot. And I was sharing content about the work that I was doing as a photographer in a world where no one else was doing that. So I was very, very vilified early on in my career for basically giving away trade secrets. But mm. lucky for me, I sort of saw around the corner. I've, I could have absolutely been wrong on this one, but I, I felt like I could bet the farm on, on just sharing all of my trade secrets in a really transparent way. And over the, you know, I, I remember putting out one of my first internet videos just about, I don't even remember what the top, what it was now, but this is even pre YouTube. This was when it was Google video and like 35,000 people watched it the first day. And this is in 2004 or five, five or something like that. I'm like, Oh my God. <laughs> like, hmm. There is, you know, there is, there are people who actually care about what a photographer does for a living and what it's like to be one and live that life. And, you know, uh, hundreds of videos later, I realized that, you know, that is, you know, storytelling and, and, you know, connecting with people on an individual basis across scale, you know, through commenting and YouTube posts like that. There's something there that people really gravitate towards. There's an educational component. There's an inspirational component. So I was basically content doing that, but realizing all along that there was a real market to not just to inspire people around whatever it is that they wanted to do, but actually the the knowledge that I have specifically as a photographer. And I connected with a, a dear friend of mine named Craig Swanson, who was my Mac tech support guy at the time. He was running you know a, a company that was supporting all of the ad agencies and big creative companies in the Northwest up here in Seattle. And he was also aspiring to sort of break free and, and wanted to build an education platform. And I didn't know what shape it, the things that I was doing was going to take, you know, but I was in a sense just giving away free content and watching people, you know, rapidly, con you know, it's, it was north of a million people at that time. And, and when you have a million people, you can, you know, you can certainly move 
move the needle. And I had never, you know, that audience wasn't something that was built intentionally. It was mostly from giving away content. And so Craig and I started like literally spending Sundays whiteboarding about what, what would this thing look like if we could make something up where we provided access to the world's top experts in, in, you know, in any category of creative category or entrepreneurship, for example. And after I would say half a dozen or, or so Sundays spent, you know, drinking too much coffee and jamming on the whiteboard, we had a, we had a thumbnail sketch. And so it, to look back and summarize was really following my personal passion of sharing a story about my career, looking at what people were hungry for and also reconciling that with what I wanted to be and do. And it was those sort of key moments, whiteboarding with my friend Craig, realizing that the internet was going to completely blow open access to information and to the world's top experts. And, you know, how could I add value to the people that were interested in what I was doing? And, and ideally, I didn't stand in the way, you know, I, I'm just one person and I, it was going to be nice to get my name off the door. And I had so many friends who, you know, are the people we've already mentioned and the people that are at the top of the game, you know, the, the best entrepreneurs, the, the, whether it's Branson or Gary Vaynerchuk or Tim Ferriss or like basically create a platform where beyond my own sort of reach, you know, these folks reach and, and certainly they have lessons to share and, and, so we cultivated this idea called Creative Live, and today we're the world's largest live streaming education company. We're focused specifically on photography, design, um, music and audio, entrepreneurship, and we're bringing the world's top experts to to the world for free. Uh, I think we're, we're, we've had more than two billion minutes consumed on, on our video platform now, so I like to think it's working. Yeah, no, that's amazing. I... Uh, you know, this morning was going through, you know, kind of kind of Ryan's history and bio, if you will, getting ready for my interview with him and came across his PR course. And he's got two or three, you know, hosted with you guys and, you know, noticed that it's been purchased over 10,000, well, close to 10,000 times. It's coming <laughs> up on 10,000. Yeah. I was uh, I was the newest one this morning and, and spent about two hours going through that that program. And I was just like, man, I I thought this was just for you know, photographers. <laughs> and so, you know, like, here's yeah, Ryan. Fair, fair enough. Yeah. With his course on PR and marketing, I'm like, huh, interesting. And so y'all have really expanded beyond, beyond that realm. It looks like. And For sure. So would it be For fair? Sure. To guys like Reed, Reed, Reed Hoffman, you know, the founder of LinkedIn, billionaire, whatever, how many businesses he's, you know, been involved early with PayPal, LinkedIn, and as an investor with Greylock. Now, you know, you want to learn about entrepreneurship. You want to learn from a guy like Reed. You know, I already mentioned Tim Ferriss, he launched the four hour chef, his last book on our platform before you could even get the book in stores. Other folks have been on your, your show, like Lewis Howes, um, how about building an online business? And those are, those folks are all bringing their, their, their sort of core message and a lot of value to, to creative live. And so you can, okay, it's certainly beyond just photography and design. It's, it's really about making a living and a life in, in the things that you dream about being. Is there a difference between Creative Live uh, versus the other e-learning platforms, if you will, out there like you know Udemy or uh, you know those those other services? Yeah, most definitely. Um, so I, I definitely don't want to disparage. Like I'm a huge advocate of online learning and just you know being self-taught. For example, again, another parallel with the title of your show. So it's not my goal to disparage anybody, but the the way that we we are different is. Where A, it's from not just people who are good or know something about this thing. These are the world's best. These are Pulitzer Prize winners, New York Times bestsellers, Emmy Award winning, you know, Oscar nominated directors. And like, and to me, learning from people who are actually doing the thing in and of itself is, you know, is miles different than and not to disparage a local community college teacher or someone who knows a lot. But when you really you're learning it from someone who who is one of, you know, is world class in that thing. That That's a key differentiator. Another one is just, you know, my background as a, as a, <laughs> a, a director, uh, you know, making commercials for all these top brands and, you know, hundreds and hundreds of online videos. We bring the really high production value to the, to the thing because we want it to feel like you're there in the room and that it's, it's got some sort of a grid. It's just not one person talking to a webcam. It's four to four to eight cameras, all in HD multi switched. So you're getting all kinds of different views it feels like a very very rich experience and then 
that that the material is actually it's very very actionable and and very there's certainly there's theory in there but it's also super tactical because people want answers they don't want more questions we've all got, got so many questions so what are the big hurdles that we can help you solve and when you're talking you know you're learning from people who have actually gone through those challenges that information is just so much more spot on versus some of the other folks either you know YouTube videos or or, or Udemy or the folks where where those classes are self-produced by people who aren't necessarily professional video people or they don't have a you know a bunch of people helping you design the curriculum which is what we do at Creative Live so you know there's a handful of differences and all of which I think make for you know the sort of the most robust learning experience that you can you can get on the on the internet whether you're you know at home sitting in your underwear and Ohio, or you're actually physically in the class at Creative Live, we like to think that you you get you know some next level stuff. Yeah, so I would say hand selected you know guests or instructors, if you will, with professional grade production and, and vision. If I could sum up the, the primary difference to me, that that would be it. For sure, world class people shot in a very very rich way with multi cameras and. And it's in a high quality environment too, like the product. It's long form video, you know, broken up into five to twenty five minute chunks. But it's enough of a, enough material there for you to actually make progress, not just a two minute YouTube video on how to boil an egg. This is things like how to, you know, become an entrepreneur, launching that online business, writing, a, you know, your first screenplay, or um, yeah. Well, it's a bit eerie that you mentioned Reed Hoffman uh, a minute ago <laughs> because okay. he, I have his name listed in my notes for our talk today. And that's just a completely random coincidence. But, uh, nice. you know, obviously it's, it's there for a reason. And the reason that I have him listed is that, you know, he talks a lot about and has written a lot about his concept of blitz scaling. So scaling up your company as fast as humanly possible to capture, you know, the market, which is what we've watched Uber do, I, I think is probably the biggest example that everybody would be familiar with over the last couple of years. And it's probably the biggest example in the history of the world <laughs> of you know, a company going from zero to 60 billion in valuation in five and a half years. Like, I don't think that's ever happened. So the but good, good point. Anyway, I'll give you that one. Yeah, no, exactly. So, you know, when it comes to, to creative live, you know, this is, I'm assuming your first, you know, startup of, of this size and magnitude, you've taken on, you know, venture funding, uh, I believe. So correct me if I'm wrong. You know, for the businesses that I've started over my career, I've self-funded all of them. And I've, for that reason, needed to make sure that they were profitable as soon as, as possible. And they, and they have been. But if that's going to be the case, that makes it very difficult to take advantages of capturing a market as you would through a, a blitz scaling campaign. You have to bring on the funds that you would need to scale up the team and bring on the resources that you'd need in order to accomplish that. Yes. And so I see the benefits from it, but you know, I'll definitely just admit there's a, a fear side to me to doing that because you're taking on other people's money. Your expectations are at a whole new level now. You're not just disappointing yourself, you know, if you fall flat, but uh, you know, all of all of your other investment group. So what has that process been like for you since this is, again, the first time you've probably gone through this process yourself? Sure. We'll talk about, there's a theoretical layer and then there's a practical layer. I'll touch on the theoretical and then we'll dive right into the practical. practical. So the, the theoretical is I don't believe that there's ever been a time, unlike or more than right now, where the riskier thing is actually to do the typical what people assume you should do. It's a um, the conservative approach. Yeah, doing the conservative approach is is very likely to keep you tied in a sea of mediocrity, or certainly keeping me me mediocre company. And I say that like your peers in business, not on an individual basis, but brands or whatever that you'd be competing with. And you know, as I said earlier, sort of being different, not just better, is a requirement. So I, I like to think that the risk profile has actually been flipped in this sort of new era that, that's upon us right now. And to that end, uh, I also have built a handful of, you know, my photography studio went from zero to, you know, one of the top one half of, of percent of earning studios in the country of the world rather quickly. And it was also, as you said, built very much on, it was bootstrapped and, and whatnot. And that took me even, I call that rise quick, but that was years and years. 
I think I learned another thing. I, I launched the first iPhone app that shared photos to social networks in 2009 called Best Camera. That that went to number one in the App Store within, I think, three, three days of being available. And there's all kinds of upside there. You know, had million down, millions of downloads. Um, and back then, that was when apps were expensive. And I was the only person on the cap table. Cap table of one. And I thought that was the right thing to do. And as all these venture folks are coming to me and, and, you know, offering to invest in my business, I sort of just got paralyzed from success and didn't take the initiative to be bold. And, you know, now everyone on this podcast definitely knows Instagram that came a year, year and a half after Creative Live. So to me, that was a billion dollar mistake. Um, And when I say a billion, I mean, literally, like we, we had we were way out in front of everyone. There was no such no such app. It was app of the year in two thousand and nine. Yet no no none of your listeners would be able to, to to know it. So those are things that I consider like that's me taking the less risky route. And look where that got me. Those were both you know I mean the photography not example not not a good example, but certainly the best phone app was a great example of not really being aggressive enough. And then so with Creative Live, like you can just see this natural progression of learning from previous big mistakes and we there's certainly a, a an advantage to making an amazing prototype and having something that works that has traction that was the difference that you know i think that creative live had is once we, you know we launched this thing and we're instantly profitable i think our first class had like 50,000 people in it and that was that was an, an indication that we should step on the gas pedal so you know we basically ran as hard and fast as we could and it, fortunately, again, I had a, a large following with which to jumpstart the business. But as soon as we had traction and all these things and, you know, I just started having conversations with with uh, people that are introduced to me in my network and showing them real results, a real product, really having traction. And um, when you have a business that does have that has not just grit, not just a great idea, but real traction and, and actual revenue, then that's the time to use other people's money when you don't have an idea and you're you're you think you might have a concept like that's not the best you know and you don't have a prototype like it's just there's so many people that are out there starting businesses like that and those are usually really bad terms for the entrepreneur and so I'm an advocate of, of flipping that and that's what I did with creative live as soon as we got traction when we were skyrocketing it was a great time for me to talk to some of the best investors in the world you know we talked to the Greylocks and the benchmarks and the did you, social capitals and all the fancy terms. So. Did you have a Did you have a mentor that you really relied on during that initial phase? As I'm assuming, you know, it's all fairly new to you at that point. Uh, I know it would be for me, and that's those are not meetings sure. that I would really want to take. Uh, you know, walking in blind without without a lot of experience, or at least somebody on my side that could help me navigate that. For sure, and, and that's one of the reasons I love the community that you built here. Because so much of my success is really about sort of the community. And, you know, when you've got something that's really, you know, that's game changing or has the potential to do so, when your passion about other people can feel that sort of passion and commitment, people are excited to help you. And that energy is completely infectious. And I was living that because I was, you know, living my dream of, oh my God, now I can get my name off the door instead of just being a, a well known photographer. Like, how can we help millions of people? put this little thing together and that energy that I brought to the project. And I think that any, any of the listeners um, who are paying attention, you know, today that, that is something that you can sense. And when you've, you're putting out that kind of energy in the world and you're willing to ask questions and seek mentors, people are excited to help. And, and you know, you have to tell your story, right? The world talks in narrative uh, and, and so Basically, I, I went around trying to loop as many people into my, you know, big hairy dream as possible, and you know, certainly had friends from successful career and you know previous career that I was able to ask for help and support. So I did have a handful of mentors, and so many of those were were again people that are on your show, and certainly I, you know, I mentioned Branson; he's an investor in Creative Live, but that really came over time. It was a lot of entrepreneurs who there are a lot of entrepreneurs out there who are willing to share their story. You know, that's, I started an interview series called Chase Jarvis Live, interviewing some of the top creatives in the world, people from Hollywood, um, people from music and, you know, folks like, uh, Macklemore, 
I've already mentioned, you know, Tim, Guy Kawasaki. These are people that not only you know, was I getting information, but I was trying to make it available to other people at the same time. And those introductions and that sort of mentorship really helps get your foot in the door. And, you know, Mike, no doubt, you know, a lot of successful folks. There's a, a certain deconstruction that one does. You know, and that's, uh, I think, a takeaway from the interview is that there's this deconstruction process that when you become good at one, one thing, you found out what it took to, to become good at that, what kinds of people you wanted to meet, what, you know, how being good at a particular craft, or, you know, what you needed to get good at, and then applying that to your next adventures. That's what I did in photography from entrepreneurship. And, a, you know, a core piece of that was, you know, your network and people who are close to you and who can you get invite, advice from. So, again, that's a thing that I think is, it's so under talked about, under discussed. Um, it's remiss in our, I think, uh, in many entrepreneurial circles, what, you know, getting good at one thing and then looking at the patterns that w made that thing successful and then par parlaying that into your next gig. So yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you mentioned your living goal. proof that it works. Yeah, no, it's interesting. You mentioned that your goal is to get your name off the door and I just, you're the first person who's ever put it that way, but I, I love it because that is my goal <laughs> right now. <laughs> and when you, you know, when you spend the majority of your career where your, your name is your business at that point, yeah. you, you realize that there's a ceiling to that and that you can never walk away from it. And so that's really interesting where my sole goal for, for my new venture is to take Mike Dillard and, and that name and make it really kind of irrelevant, you know, as far as the company itself goes and its success and the impact that it has so that it can be bigger than, than my thoughts or, you know, vision. Um, yeah. And there's something that's so egocentric too. It's like, I'm, you know, just, uh, I'm sitting here at the creative life studios in Seattle right now. And, um, we have, we have, you know, one of the largest education events in the history of the world on a regular basis is happening right now. It's Photoshop week. We have 150,000 students from all over the world who will tune in for this Photoshop class this week. We can take Photoshop from the world's best. And I walked in this morning, we were just looking around. There's, you know, there's a hundred people that go to work every day. They're super passionate, very, very hard charging that love what they do, love the impact that our business and that they get to have on the world. And to me, you get to step, you know, as a you know co-founder, you get to step away from the ego of as an independent artist, always having to say your name in every sentence or, you know, just there's so much ego wrapped into it. And it, I was definitely yearning to get, get away from that and to build something with other people. And, you know, that's learning from from <laughs> getting to learn from super smart people is something that if you're, you know, a solopreneur or a, a small business owner, Owner. it's hard to, to draw that and that's really one of the reasons I wanted to scale and, and you know do things with people that were bigger and smarter and faster than me for sure. And now that you've gotten to that point is there anything that you wish you would have known ahead of time? Any, any big potholes that you, you stepped in that man if you could go back would have been a really valuable lesson learned for you? Oh man they all I love the nature of this question <laughs> I've, I've uh, thought, of, thought a lot about it and more often than not, all of the individual tactics that I could list or the problems, like the specific problems, they all go down to one thing and that's, that, that is following your intuition. Like there's this thing called our, you know, we talk about it being our gut and every one of the things where I've really messed up or where I have found myself like even go back to early in my career, like pursuing medical school. I did that because my parents and my uh, you know, uncle one day said, Oh, you know what smart, hardworking people do? They become doctors or lawyers or, and I was like, Oh, okay, I guess I, I don't know better. That's what I, you know, and my gut the whole time was <laughs> like that. I wasn't interested in that at all. And then I ended up going on a multi-year $50,000 student debt sort of dead end sure I could have become those things, but you realize that, Oh my God, that's a life full of that was not the life for me. So my clear takeaways are all around following your gut and the, the intuition of the entrepreneur. It's either you're either not right or not right, right this minute. But ultimately if you don't follow that thing, you're going to be in way more danger 
than if you do? The answers aren't really out, out there in market validation. Do you think Travis from Uber, I mean, he knew what he wanted to build and has this sort of a relentless approach to it. I mean, taking on the New York Taxi Commission, for God's sake, like that. <laughs> and, and you can't sign up for a bigger pain in the neck. And you know, he had this thing deep, deep inside him that he was sort of chasing. And, and that's that intuition, that gut. And the times where I've been the most misled were around trying to do the things that other people thought were, were best. Mm, yeah, I'm, I think it's a great way to, to, to distill it down to a, you know, a, core, a core cause, if you will. On the, on the flip yeah. side... Let me let me dovetail one more thing around that, and that is like when you are solving these problems, either as a you know as an artist or entrepreneur or whatever. Like the if you're not emotionally invested in this thing, if you're if it's not something that's personally important to you, I'm telling you, it's it things get so hard <laughs> when you're when you're trying to create you know something that has the impact on the order of what we're talking about. Things get so hard. And if you're not scratching your own itch, and by that I mean solving a problem that you personally have, but that is likely that millions of other people have, if you're not following that, you know, focused on that stuff, you're not going to have the energy when stuff gets real hard to push through. If you're chasing some random market opportunity and you don't really care about the product that you're making, your chances of standing out, of being better and different, not just different, almost zero so just i guess layer that in <laughs> if you're uh if you're at home thinking about this stuff right now don't forget about that yeah no I, I agreed and i think i think anybody from branson you know branson across the board has given fairly similar advice and i found it to be true you know in my life as well is the, the moment that you start chasing after a financial event of some kind is the moment that you're you're toast yeah um so the the you know the sooner you can forget about the money side and just do and build what you want to build because of the end result and the passion you have for it that's the ultimate you know secret to long term success so I would definitely have to have to agree with that you know on the the flip side of that of that previous question and feel free to get as tactical as you want you know or whatever it may be just whatever comes to mind first what have been some of the biggest wins or correct decisions that you guys have made along the way it's important to me, I guess, access to information has always been a core value. That was, you know, what I started putting out information about what it was like to be a photographer as I was starting out and breaking into the industry, providing access for anyone with an internet connection, regardless of how much you could afford. So the, I guess we always layer, we, at Creative Lab, we layer in a freemium product. You can watch 24 hours a day, seven days a week for free in any one of the channels in the you know the photography channel the design channel the the business the money and life channel for free you can access these people now the business model is such that if you want to own that content or or um, watch it on your own schedule then you buy it that's what the purchase is for is to you know give you any time access um, but that free layer was a huge thing that we got right every other education platform is behind a paywall where you have to give your credit card or it's some subscription price and 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 we just put it out there so that you can come in and see, oh my gosh, huge rock stars teaching about stuff that actually matters to me and the things that I want to do, be, and become. Um, so that was a huge decision on a tactical level to provide access in that freemium model. Um, that was a big win. And I think another one is, is actually building something. I get, you know, I advise a lot of startups. I get solicited all the time for advice and um, just really gen general ideas that they're not worth anything. I mean, you know, it, it's very much about the execution. And so building, you know, uh, the default mode being action rather than pontificating is a huge win also. Um, and uh, I, I think as an artist was always, that was my bias towards actually going, you know, given the chance to go or not go or go to, or stay home and think about it. It was always go because adventures are sort of what builds character and and uh, help you learn the things that people actually do do want. So, to me, building prototypes as an entrepreneur is a huge thing, whether it's a digital one or if you're selling physical goods, because so many people are reluctant. That in a, that action, that act, 
itself separates you from so many people. You're and automatically, you walk, yeah, in the 1%. Yeah, you're automatically in the 1% because the world is full of, of talkers, less of doers. So um, <laughs> those, those are, you know, two, and you know, go back to just scratching your own itch. Like those are really, really key things for me. I was very, and still am very deeply about, passionately about the future of creativity. Creativity is the new literacy. It's at an all time high and you know, it's the number one thing that 1500 CEOs polled said that they were looking for in, in, in their future coworkers and, and executive staff is, is creativity. So like, I'm very passionate about that. And so I put all, all my eggs into, into that basket. So, um, so those are some key core techs. Yeah. Here's a, here's a really random question, at least, at least it may come across that way, but it's something that I think about a, a lot, quite a bit, and it's starting to come up in conversations more and more specifically with a previous guest who was on a couple of weeks ago. You know, we've seen videos come out over the last 12 months where you know, AI essentially and robots are starting to paint and to do creative things or at least at least uh, project the illusion that they're, you know, they're being creative even though they're not necessarily. They're producing, you know, work that unless you knew it was done by a computer, you wouldn't know otherwise. Have you ever thought about that and what the, let's just call it for now, because it's not genuine, but the illusion of creativity by machines will ultimately mean for human creativity in the next 20 years? I believe that machines are going to get real smart real fast. Right. And I mean, even just look at, uh, at Tesla, you know, their whole, all the Teslas on the road are capturing data at all times and communicating back with the, the, the mothership Tesla about, you know, data about every individual road in, let's just say the U S and you, you, you aggregate that sort of machine learning and, and that kind of data. And, and we're going to, we're going to get really smart, really fast. If that's the case, it's more likely that machines are going to be able to nail rote tasks. Like them being creative is not out of the picture or out of mind, but it's certainly further away from them doing things that you can program. And so that's one of the reasons that I think our culture is realizing subliminally, um, others overtly like myself, that the value that creativity in the classic sense is on the rise, is at, a, at an all-time high and continues to be on the rise. At least for the time being, what those computers that, that my understanding of AI at the, in, in its current like those are still emulating creativity or they're able to put unlike things together, but not necessarily create use because that's one of the core definitions of creativity, right? You want to put things that are unlikely to be together together to form a new thing. And ideally that thing is useful. Machines can basically mimic that. And that is, you know, that is a differentiator that, that humans have over a lot of other species is the ability to make, you know, new things and make things, new things that are useful, like tools from the primate. It's for example, versus goldfish have a hard, harder time doing something like that. So I don't think that creativity is something that machines won't be able to do. And all the research that you just cited says that it's moving in that direction. But how much further off is like really rich multidimensional creativity from just rote jobs and rote, you know, and very, very simple daily tasks. So if you're wanting to be secure and you're wanting to sort of stay above the fray and be different and better. And to me, this, this, what is core to human is something that we should, we should gravitate to. So that's where I place my personal value on the future of creativity. And hopefully computers will continue to, <laughs> to be our friend, but it's certainly, it's certainly easy to, it's not a, it's not a leap intellectually or logically to say that if, if ultimately computers are going to be able to be very creative, certainly not being creative will come first. So there is this premium on on uh, high high level multi dimensional creativity. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I was I was really interested to see what your your take on that would be. So we've got about two minutes left. Final question for you is: What is your biggest challenge in life right now today? Whether that's personally or professionally, and and what do you need help most with? Ooh, you you're not you're not anything are you you're just going to throat <laughs> um oh, I, I appreciate that mike i think a perpetual challenge and i hope you know i hope this plenty of folks in your audience identify with this because i know it's a thing for me 
the perpetual challenge is focus. And in a, in a world of shiny things and with a curious mind and access to so many different things, especially as, you know, the even early signs of success sort of can be get more success and it's easy to, to get distracted, but sort of a ruthless focus on the things that matter to you. Certainly we can talk about those in terms of like the human needs, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and whatnot. You need to have those met, but I'm talking about like from a business perspective or entrepreneurially or, or whatnot, like just a ruthless focus. Um, I guess it could be in personal development too. And like what actually matters to you and what are you, are you willing to do to get there, to achieve it, to, to have those things, knowing that, you know, nothing is for sure. And all things are ultimately temporary. Like, what are you doing with your time? You know, what's going to get you to choose one thing instead of another, you know, who are you spending your time with? If you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with, are you really choosing your friends and the time that you spend wisely? And to me, that is a perpetual challenge. Um, some of the ways that I actually deal with that are I set a time, set time aside every day and ask myself if I'm doing the things that matter. I have a really specific morning routine that I write about on my blog at chasejarvis.com slash blog about how I sort of attune myself for every day. And I'm constantly sort of, it has to be in the front of my mind to not chase the shiny things and to stay focused. And, you know, again, things like morning routines and what's making. And, and another core thing for me has been meditation. Those are the things that help me keep focused on on the big things that really matter to me because it's very easy to fill up a life with just busy stuff and and being busy isn't a sign of success it's a sign of a lack of priority so mm. there's a there's a, a true statement right there if i've ever heard one for sure well this has been incredibly educational and um i think the uh you know the insights specifically i'll just say for myself i can't speak for anyone else were, were unbelievably valuable on how you guys have have you know really launched and, and grown creative live to to where it's been and the level of quality and the standard of, standard of quality that you have incorporated into the business to set it aside i think is uh, an unbelievable lesson to to look at and to to take away and where should everybody go you know besides chasejarvis.com to that's where they can connect with you should they go sure. to creativelive.com or um, absolutely. Yeah. Like that's, I'm putting so much of my time and so much of my time and energy into creative life right now. And again, I think I'm happy to, <laughs> to connect with you online. That's, uh, but I'm just one man. And, uh, well, creative live is an entire community of a thousand of the top experts in the world. They've created more than 10,000 hours of super high end content over 25,000 lessons there. So you learn from somebody, <laughs> a lot of people who are a lot smarter than me, and uh, and about a whole myriad of things. Um, it's a great place to. It's a great resource. And of course, you can get feedback or give feedback to me personally or Creative Live. We're basically, you know, I'm slash Chase Jarvis on basically everything. And Creative Live is is Creative Live. You know, creative the word and then L I V E. So I'd love to get connect with your audience. We'll we'll uh, see if we can set something special up in the show notes for uh, for your audience. And I, just a huge shout out to you, Mike, for doing the work that you do and. You know, I have my own personal show, Chase Jarvis Live, and I know how much time and effort goes into making these things. And just debt of gratitude to you. I'm, I've been binge listening of late to your stuff, and it's it's been really helpful, super inspirational. And I wanted to give a shout out back at you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that very much. That's awesome. And on a personal note, I would love to connect when you're here in Austin for South by coming up. And thank you so much for the time today. It was awesome to have you. And and uh, I appreciate the support of the show for sure. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Mike. I'm a big fan. I really appreciate the work. Awesome. Chase Jarvis, everybody, thank you so much for listening once again. And we'll see you next week. Take care. So guys, Chase and his team have put together a free membership option just for Self-Made Man listeners. The quality and the content that they have for you and I at the site is absolutely amazing. I am a paying customer myself and was before I actually was introduced to Chase, and it has quickly become one of my all-time favorite resources. So to take advantage of that offer, head over to creativelive.com forward slash self-made man so they can hook you up. Take care, and we'll see you next time.
Oh, no. 